Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out. I know it's a little difficult after the whiskey tasting, but it's awesome to see you all here. Uh, I'm doing a talk on hacking the Chipson, so if any of you have seen the Hackers movie, you'll get the reference. Um, however, we won't be hacking the Gibson, but we'll be hacking something else. So why are we here? Um, well, we're here to hack chips. Um, we're obviously here for Node things, so I'll be talking a little bit about Node. And uh, I want to talk to you about a project that I started working on recently called A VR Girl. Let me just start my timer. OK. So uh, my name is Suze Hinton. Uh, I am NoobCat on Twitter and GitHub and just about everything else. Um, I live in New York City. And I'm a front-end dev at Kickstarter, which is super fun. So I have a lot of cool stories and a lot of cool projects that I've backed there. And so I really like electronics. And this has kind of been a part of my life um, for a long time. I had the first Arduino when it came out because I was so excited to play with it. So you know, I've kind of had this crazy journey of making weird contraptions and then coming full circle to actually start creating tools for other people to create crazy contraptions. Um, so who can tell me what this is? Oh, someone had it specifically. Well done. So this is a microchip. Specifically, it is the ATtiny85. This thing is like super powerful, OK? It has an entire eight kilobytes of program memory, <laughs> um, which is actually a lot when you're, when you're programming these. So you know, don't snub it too quickly. It also has six I.O. lines. So you can plug sensors and motors and all sorts of things into those lines. Um, it runs at up to 20 megahertz, like lightning fast. Um, <laughs> but the cool thing about it is it's actually less than a centimeter in length. So it's this tiny little guy. And I actually have one of them. So if you'd like to see them later, let me know. It also comes in at approximately one and a half euros. That's pretty great, right? And it can do a lot of things. You know, it has its own separate uh, timing counter that you can access. Uh, it actually has this interrupt mode where you can almost do asynchronous programming, um, which when you think about it, that's pretty powerful for a pound, uh, sorry, a euro and a half. So I know what you're thinking already. You're like, well, I, I, I want to hack some chips. You know, I want to do some stuff with this. Seems really cool. The problem is that you know there's a lot of people that want to play with hardware, <laughs> but there's not a lot of people that want to sit down or, or, and learn how to do C, uh, which Mike seems to be really good at, as we saw this morning. Um, and, and so there's this little sliver in the middle that seemed to always have access to this stuff, but everyone else doesn't really have access to it. What's cool is the Node.js community came in a few years ago and actually improved that. So who here has heard of Node.bots? I know you have. Cool. OK. So Nodebots is this really cool concept where instead of having to write C, you can write JavaScript or Node.js, and then you can interact with devices in that way. And so I think maybe the cocktail maker tonight is actually powered by one of these libraries. Um, and so we, we have all of these. Like These are just four examples of libraries and ecosystems in JavaScript you can use as Johnny5, uh, Espruno, uh, Tessel, Cylon. Really, really cool stuff. There's even a uh, node school, node workshopper, where you don't even have to have any hardware plugged into your device, uh, to your laptop, and you can still learn node bots. So I highly encourage you to look into that. Pretty much everything Cassandra is wearing today is powered by node bots, so please ask her about that. Um, and so there's now meetups, and we're finding that web engineers you know, can actually cross over and do really fun stuff. You know, they can now become electrical engineers in their spare time, or they can even switch careers, because this is a gateway drug into being able to play with machines, which I really love. Um, but can we go further with this? You know, a, a limitation that I've been seeing with some of this JavaScript stuff is that you can, uh, you can play with this stuff, but a lot of the time, your machine has to still be tethered to your computer, or it has to run on something really high-powered like Linux in order to you know, run itself, or you're actually locked into someone's physical hardware for their particular library. And so there's still some limitations, and you know, I sort of want to push that a little bit further. And so what if you want to go it alone with like these Atmel chips that I'm talking about today? Um, you know, you might have something like this custom circuit here, uh, which is actually just uh, four lights, and it also has all of these little traces that are measuring resistance. So this will be like a pressure pad 
um, and it will have a chip connected to it to be able to read those values and to send power to those lights. This is the kind of thing that I see a lot in the hardware world. You know, someone comes onto a forum and they say, I'm having this problem. And someone just immediately writes back, like, do the maths properly and sit down and use consistent sizes. And, and I, I just don't think that that's super welcoming. Um, and I don't have to look hard on a lot of the resources online that, that I participate in to see this kind of thing happening. Um, I just don't think it's great. And the funny thing about this particular answer is it was wrong. Um, <laughs> the original poster was actually correct, and uh, Atmel actually, they got in touch with Atmel, and Atmel said, oh, yeah, it's a typo in our data sheet. Sorry about that. Like, you were actually correct. So, you know, it's not, it's not always great. You're not always correct either when you're being rude. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you kind of feel like this, and you're like, I just... Maybe this place isn't for me. Um, and so it does still have a high barrier to entry, especially if you're ready to sort of move beyond the Arduino architecture. And, you know, I really want to change that. Um, so I've started, you know, moving from, again, creating, you know, projects to actually trying to be behind the scenes enabling people to do this. Um, and so let's look at the current tool chain in C to see what we have to work with right now in order to play with these chips. You know, there's no JavaScript. Uh, we have three things in this toolchain. One is the very imaginatively named libc. Um, it's a C library that gives you all of the helper functions to interact with the pins on this chip and to access the counter system and things like that. So this is sort of what you import into your code in order to, to use this stuff. So it would be the same as like requiring Johnny5 or something like that. Uh, then we have um, GCC, and this is a slightly AVR-flavored one, um, so that it, it can do the compilation down to assembly properly. And once that's compiled down to assembly, we need to find a way to put it on our microchip, right? And so AVR Dude, which does have a quite imaginative name, uh, AVR Dude is responsible for then taking that compiled code and uh, uploading it onto your chip. So I thought, okay, um, the first two are kind of difficult, so maybe I'll go with the easy one first. So I thought, let's, let's have a look at AVR Dude. Let's see if I can bring AVR Dude into the Node.js world. So cool fact about AVR Dude, it's actually less than 500 kilobytes, which I haven't been able to beat so far. That's really cool. And it's a single executable that you install, and then, and then you can run it. Uh, in case you were wondering, AVR Dude stands for download, AVR Downloader Uploader. It's a very funny backronym. Um, I thought it was a little bit forced, but you know, it's cool. Uh, it used to be called AVR Prog, but then that got confused with the official software that ended up being called that, so they changed it. Um, so you know, this is kind of the workflow when you're using AVR Dude. You do your code, uh, you compile it down with GCC. And then you have to send it to this device in the middle, right, between your chip and your computer. And it's called a programmer. Um, this is one of the ugliest programmers out there, so I put a rainbow on it because I thought, you know. <laughs> um, and then the programmer takes your code just in binary, and then it figures out which pins to flip on the chip in order to get that chip to self-program itself with your code. Um, and so AVR Dude is the first green arrow uh, on the left. It's the bit where between the laptop and you know your, your chip. It's doing that with the software. So AVR Dude has some really good strengths. Um, first of all, it works really well. Uh, it has super wide support for a lot of um, programmers and chips and and that kind of thing. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's about 16 years old. Uh, <laughs> if you look at the Git commits, you know you can trace it all the way back. Um, and, you know, it was written originally for BSD, so if that gives you an idea. Um, and it actually has a lot of traction, you know, because it's been around for so long and it's so solid and it just works. And there's like a million forks of it. Um, the Arduino IDE, for example, uses AVR Dude underneath a special fork in order to flash your Arduino code. Um, it has a lot of traction, so everyone just uses it and no one really questions it. Um, and I've, you know, I've used it a lot in the past as well. Um, however, there were some limitations that I was in particular frustrated with, but I've heard other frustrations as well from people, which is that it's command line only. So you can't like require it as part of your code. 
Uh, you have to run it in a separate process and check for exit codes and things like that. And it's not super natural. And a lot of apps that I've created, such as in Python or something, has to kind of spin that up. And you have to pipe the standard out into the correct process. And it's not super fun unless you're just straight up flashing a chip, right? Uh, it doesn't have any tests, which is probably OK because it's so, it runs so well. Um, but I like the idea of having testable software because then people are more likely to want to iterate on it. Uh, and it has a super fragmented community. You know, you, you just read random blogs as you're Googling around, and it's more self-discovery, which can be a little frustrating. The documentation is very limited. It's very um, dry. You know, it's just listing the methods. Um, so I thought, what would be involved in creating a Node.js alternative, and, and why, other than you know, addressing some of these limitations? Well, this particular tweet really tickled me, and it was around the time that I was writing this presentation, which is, you know, Morpheus, do you take the blue pill or the red pill? And the JavaScript community says, well, we didn't quite like either, so we made a green one. Um, you know, and, and this kind of takes in the joke that there's a new framework every week, and everyone's sort of like seeing so many people turning out different things. And the sad thing is, in the hardware world, especially in Node.js, but also in the rest of the world, there's no hype fatigue. You know, you get a new iPhone every couple of years, but no one really iterates on this sort of tool chain stuff. And I want to see hype fatigue. I want to wake up and be like, oh, someone rewrote AVR dude again. But I'm not seeing that. So I'm trying to invite people to, to come along this journey and please help me with this, because I can't do it all by myself. Uh, and so you know, the, the other advantages are it encourages you to write things as a small family of packages. AVR dude is a monolith. Um, it's easier to test that way if you do that. Uh, it has better flexibility for use. And what I mean by that is you can use it on the command line. You can use it in the browser. Uh, and you can also just require it in your code. Um, you can also use it when you're making things like NWJS apps and Electron apps as well, which is very cool. Uh, and in my opinion, it's more accessible. And what I mean by that is it can be put, you know, JavaScript runs everywhere, as I just said. But also, a lot of people that are entering the programming scene are learning JavaScript. And, you know, they're probably advancing a lot quicker than when you learn C. And so making this tool chain more accessible by bringing it into like a very commonly uh, learned language, I think is a good thing. And so my castle in the sky is that, you know, Gulp and Grunt won't just be used for web, you know, stuff like web building, that eventually you'll be able to Gulp or Grunt task out your AVR chip code. And as soon as you save, it compiles and flashes and uploads. So. That's sort of the, the dream that I'm working on right now. And I, I think that's quite funny to think that they could evolve to be used for that too. So I started writing this new tool called AVR Girl. <laughs> that's how it's spelled. Uh, AVR Girl stands for AVR General <laughs> ISP Programming Tool. <laughs> I thought it'd be good to continue the tradition of backronyms. <laughs> Um, and so this is sort of what it's looking like right now. I haven't, I haven't written the kitchen sink package that brings all of them together. However, we have things like I can store my microchip configuration, you know, such as its clock speed and how much space it has on it, you know, as a JSON configuration, which is really nice, really easy to read. Um, Self-contained like protocol and driver packages. So your programmers are your physical devices, and they speak a certain protocol between you and the computer in order to upload your code. So breaking the protocols and the programmers down into bits too means that you can have these sort of standalone apps so that you don't need the entire thing. You just need like whatever programmer you're using, and that programmer will require whatever protocol that it understands. And so that's a very kind of high level look at what's going on with it so far. Um, my current progress is I've released four Packages. Um, first one is AVR Girl Arduino. So you can flash just about any uh, commonly found Arduino with AVR Girl now, which is super cool. So uh, I know a lot of people don't want to use the Arduino IDE, so that's kind of a big deal. Uh, they still have to find, you know, use AVR GCC to compile right now, but you can you can flash it with that, which is pretty cool. Um, AVR Girl STK 500 version two. That sounds like a lot, but it's just one of the communication protocols. Um, AVR Girl Chips JSON, which is just 
lots of little JSON objects of all of the microchips. So I'm starting to translate the um, configurations from the data sheet into these objects. And AVR Girl ISP Mark II. Now the ISP Mark II is something I have on stage with me, and that's one of the programmers. And it actually speaks SDK 500 version two. So you can see why I did those two modules recently. So uh, these are the current devices and chips that I've tested with, but so far, um, it, like all of these work, but I think there's a much broader reach. I just haven't gotten around to testing everything yet, so if anyone wants to help with that, that would be great, but lots and lots of Arduinos are supported. Lots of the ATtiny chips are also supported, so I'm pretty excited to see all of this coming together. Maybe I'll be done by Christmas. Uh, and I've already created an app with it. Um, this is a friend's Kickstarter. It's called The Public Radio. Uh, it is a hipster radio that only has one radio station. Uh, <laughs> and so it has a volume button that turns it on and off. So if you want to change that radio station, you have to reflash the chip, right? And so, uh, <laughs> so I came, you know, I wrote the original software for them in Python and I wasn't happy with it. So I just recently did an NWJS version and it is just so much nicer than Python T Kinter's, you know, GUI kit. So um, I can demo this later on. I've brought the device with me. So if you see me with it out on the lawn, I'll definitely show you. Um, but, you know, like, how dangerous can JavaScript with chips be? Well, I, I want to show that really quickly. We, we are blazing through our time. I need a volunteer. You don't have to get up on stage. You just have to, like, Emily, OK. <laughs> All right, Emily. We're going to play Brick My Chip, OK? So you, you need to Brick My Chip on stage. This is a fun one? OK, awesome. I want you to choose the correct fuse. So fuses are settings on chips that allow you to set the clock speed and whether or not it has an internal or external crystal and things like that. I want you to choose the fuse value that will brick this chip. Uh, 123. <laughs> 123, OK. We're going to do that. All right. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. OK. Let's see if we can get this out of Power Saver. All right. So I'm going to plug this in real quick. My hands are shaking. OK. All right. So see how that light there is flashing? If you successfully brick it, it will stop flashing. OK. So I'm going to I have this script. And it is node brick it. And what was the value? 123? 123, OK. Oh my god. What's happening? The fuse has been set. And do you see that? It's actually not flashing anymore. You just bricked my chip. <laughs> So I have a prize for you. It's the bricked microchip. You can keep that. Can I make it into a necklace? Yes, you can make it into a necklace. OK. <laughs> Thank you for being my volunteer. So that was actually um, like 26 lines of JavaScript. Isn't that terrifying? Um, the, the code folding was just my matrix effect. But that's all you really need to do a lot of damage. You know, fuses are actually really scary. Like, that, that's literally unrecoverable now. But it was, you know, $1.50. <laughs> Fifty euros. So anyway, <laughs> cool. Let's go back to our presentation. Um, so, you know, what lessons did I, I learn from this? Because yeah, I have a minute and a half. So let's 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 talk about it. Writing tests. Now, writing tests for hardware doesn't actually differ that much from writing tests for web. The problem is that when you push your code up to Travis CI, you can't really package up all of your hardware and like mail it to Travis CI and then tell them to plug it into the virtual machine at the other end and be like, set the Docker permissions to allow USB. It just, that's not how it works. Um, so you spend a lot of time writing mocks. Um, this is one of them that I wrote. It's called mock USB. And it just implements like a very thin layer where it just returns objects and tries to behave as expected as if it was a real machine. So you will write, spend a lot of time writing mocks, which can be like really not fun sometimes, but it's necessary. Um, where's Thorsten? Is he here? Thorsten? No? Thorsten saved my life with this module. Uh, use ProxyQuire. What ProxyQuire allows you to do is when you require your module that you're testing, uh, you can actually rep like substitute its its dependencies with like your mock dependencies. So you know, in a couple of lines of code, 
Thorsten basically saved my life. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Thank you so much. Uh, also, you use sign on JS. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. It just allows you to spy on methods and see if they're called correctly. And you can also um, like mock responses. So sometimes I've just temporarily mocked a response from my USB mock, um, which is cool. Um, bitwise logic, learn it. It's so cool. You feel like a magician. This is a real commit message from me recently. I've just felt like, you know, yeah, just hacking the planet. It's awesome. Uh, there are always exceptions to any rule, okay? So if you read something in the data sheet, sometimes it's a typo or, you know, it's not necessarily always correct. Some of these devices don't even follow the protocol that they promise they do. Um, yeah. Uh, Google is hardly ever your friend. You know, every time I tried to Google about AVR, dude, it's just people using it, not people actually unpacking it. So get used to learning things the hard way, but sometimes that can be some of the most meaningful ways. Um, if you want to follow along with my progress, it's github.com slash noobcat slash AVR girl. And then that's just a readme for now, and it's linking you to all the other packages that I've released. Uh, my blog is meow.noobcat.com, it's a long story, um, and I've been blogging about AVR girls, so I just posted a new one last night, so you can read through the SDK 500 version 2 protocol. Uh, and so, like, just don't be afraid to play with this stuff, you know, we're all creating tools to help you, and so definitely start thinking about playing with some Nodebots. You'll probably brick the chips, I mean, 20, 26 lines of code, like, we didn't really have to try. Uh, <laughs> which is half the fun. Um, it's a lot of responsibility to write software that may break everyone's stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you.